Hey, yeah. Hey, how you doing? Oh, man. <laughs> That's an auspicious start. Well, I, I just feel like, I mean, I mean, there's really only one word to describe today, honestly. <laughs> Some sort of firestorm? Um, a firestorm doesn't quite capture it. I feel like a firestorm, but like, but, but broader, hotter. Mm, really. mm, mm. If only there were a good descriptor. Conflagration. There you go. Nailed it still it. sounds so wrong. It still sounds like <laughs> I. It, it sounds like I feel like I'm saying like congregation. I feel like I, I, I visually like I'm visualizing a pew engulfed in flames. Hmm. Well. So, <laughs> so just for do, do you want to like you created this mess or or at least after I mean sort of I mean like arguably you created this mess. Uh, I'm not sure how. Go ahead. Okay. So apparently you've been saying the word conflagration as con- conflagration. <laughs> don't don't Is make there... it sound like it sounds so. All right. Yes. Um, I'll take it that way. For your life, my life. Um. And I, you know, I think we, we were talking this morning, uh, a bunch of Oxide folks, as we do in the morning, about, I think we were talking on the subject of, like, words pronounced wrong. No, we, no, I, uh, d- d- no, no, we weren't. Don't you dare leaventh all me right now. Okay. We were not, well, that's what not what we were discussing at all. What, what we, was the topic? The to- you, like, you brought this up out of, out of clear blue sky. Huh. I think. But, I think. I don't. Okay, we. Need I, some think, I think there, but... because I, I think we've got some witnesses who were there. I believe that that's that we were talking. I think we were talking about the the crypto bust or whatever, uh, weren't we? Yeah. And yeah, you had been listening to some to. recording. You had listened to a recording of me saying this recently. No, no, no. So you, at the on the Twitter space, uh, you know, two three weeks ago or whatever, you had said it, and in the moment I was like, huh, that was a. <laughs> that was a, that was an unusual slip that was of the tongue or whatever. Yeah, exactly. But you know, I wasn't gonna have a whole Twitter space dedicated. No, to that you're subject. right. Steve mispronounced a word, didn't he? Klabnik did, and I called him on it, and then you called. Yeah, him. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay, no, it's no, not, no, you're right. Don't don't, don't you eleven? I, 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 I was actually eleven following you. I was actually eleven following you. I, I was. Um, th- it, to Leventhal, by the way, is to recall history in a way that is favorable to oneself. I guess that's, that's, that's the most abstract. I think that's. I, I think that it was it was coined because early in my career, I would say, "Well, Brian, like you argued the opposite like a week ago," and yes. of course, like you. I mean, it, it's a it's sort of a, it's like there's not much you can say when someone claims that you forgot that you made an opposite claim. It sort of it puts one on the back foot. Right. This uh, position that you've adopted so emphatically is exactly the position that I adopted when we had this discussion in a certain period of time ago, and you shouted me down. That's, that's right. That's, that's right. right. And, and, and kind of spike so, strip someone. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've ever used it like fraudulently, but then m- maybe not. Maybe I misremembered. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but so we, and what was, I can't remember that, that Steve was using. Anyway, so, but, and then this, of course, th- th- then I made the mistake of confiding in the internet that I had done this. And <laughs> I mean, it was interesting. Did you see yeah. all that? I don't know if I saw all of it, but I definitely saw a lot of folks um, with a lot of interesting, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I think a lot of bearing of the soul, which you, you helped people through. Um, well, so the, the two of note, were uh, F L A C C I D, yeah, I I didn't know uh, the the actually correct pronunciation. And I did greatly appreciate that your uh, definitive source on that, as it is on most things that you that you like, <laughs> was Silicon Valley, the HBO series. HBO Silicon Valley, where Richard Hendricks, uh, where Eric insults a venture capitalist by by. Uh, describing his genitalia as flaccid and Richard Hendricks points out, actually it's pronounced flaccid. Most people don't know that. (laughs) Um, uh, So, and then the other one, and this is one that to me is, is, I wrote, so that one, obviously I accept. Um, The one you mentioned from your parents has not come up in that thread. 
I think because it's so, and I say my parents, and it's actually my mom who is who was like an English major. You, you refuse like, to sell like, your father's good name with this. Oh, my my dad would have. He's just like I don't care. It's fine. Uh, like <laughs> whatever your mom says. Um, <laughs> But I mean, my mom was like the editor of the college paper and stuff like that. So, uh, but it, I, I, I think um, one time my mom was saying that she frequented the Starbucks and I was like, mom, come on, stop. Like, don't, don't just, come on, don't be so highfalutin. And she's like, that's the word. Look it up. And, and I did. And you did. And, and she's. You know, she's basically right, and, and with she's with a kind master. of right. She she's a kind of right, but she's a no, but in a, another broader, more deeper sense, she's wrong. Well, I mean, I think the asterisk, depending on which dictionary you look at, will say, well, uh, with with varying degrees of sneering, is like you know the common folk now just say frequent. Uh, so I guess that's fine. The peasantry says frequent. You frequent the yeah. Starbucks. I mean. You, if you frequent a Starbucks, you're going to get what you deserve in that conversation. I feel, I feel that that no one is going to let that pass. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, we were in you know in New England at the time, so we're a little more you know <laughs> a little more rectitude. <laughs> a little more rectitude. Right, you just come out of your your town meeting. Um, <laughs> well, that's right. Um, so the other one though that I definitely reject is: Did you see? How do you pronounce B I O P I C? I I pronounce this as biopic. Like you do not pic about bio. I you I, do not. Honest to God, <laughs> I don't have to tell you. I do. You so you've always pronounced that bi biopic. That doesn't make yeah, it not, that... not like biopic. Like like it's some kind of myopia. Oh, like a biopic. Like it's a skin flick for like zoologists. I mean, it sounds like mammalian porn. Uh, well, was I wrong? Well, uh, sadly, you're not wrong. You're right. Sadly, it was mammalian porn. Thank you. Put those points on the board. <laughs> Biopic sounds wrong to me. It's, I, okay. So I, that don't... word, I'm just like, you know what? Actually, don't need that word, really. I don't, I don't use it very frequently. Unlike conflagration, which I actually do use frequently and have now misused. Very, I'm like, I am... I'm going to wake up in cold sweats remembering talks in which I've used this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, if, to, to, uh, to, you know, expose my own um, screw up, um, there are words that I sort of like play with and like mispronounce on purpose, but then accidentally <laughs> mispronounce. Um, one of them that I think is an interesting <laughs> word is antipodes, which I, which looks like antipodes. And as one is like looking at one scrabble board or whatever, you know, antipodes is the thing that screamed out to me. And the other day, like not jokingly, I said an antipodes, but in fact, like I do know as antipodes, but I just like uh, so I got you wrapped gave me such a start that. when you said antipodes. I'm like, wait a minute, I've been pronouncing <laughs> antipodes. Is it is that wrong? I mean, this is like a day. Like, I'm in this like hall of mirrors where everything I've done is wrong today. This is really, it's all I, crashing down around. It's, it's all crashing down around me. So there, there were, uh, but anyway, a lot of interesting responses in that thread. We won't, we won't belabor it here um because we, we we want to talk about the conflagration that is digital equipment corporation so, we will, so, we'll, so yeah good what, so what 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 got you on this deck bent like yeah, clearly you've been binge reading everything about deck that has ever been written what what kicked this off so deck i feel has been my white whale in that of i have i came up very much post deck and I, I don't think I've ever worked on a deck machine. And I have known how influential it is, certainly. Um, but I just have not spent a lot. Of, I've always kind of been meaning to spend time understanding the company a little bit better um, or a lot better and just haven't. Um, and I recall the book De Deck is Dead, Long Live Deck that, I was, that was in the missing box of books from the previous mental breakdown on Friends of Oxide um, when we did our, our book roundup. I think we mentioned Deck is Dead, Long, Deck is Dead, Long Live Deck in that someone else had read that. Maybe Dan, maybe it was you who'd read that. Um, and so I, I, I finally, like I found that book, located the box of books, found that book, read it. Um, and it's, Deck is really interesting. And I just it ended up, uh, you know, kind of one book led to another, led to another, led to another. So I think I've got six books in front of me. Oh my god! 
<laughs> so, okay, so what what is the reading list? So the reading list, I, well, so what order do you want? Do you want it in the order that I read it or the order that I'd recommend it? Because these books are not all good. Let, let's get the, uh, the the recommendations. So the, the 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 my recommendation actually is that I think is a very it is much better than Deck is Dead, Long Live Deck is a uh, book, not a great title, but the, the book is The Ultimate Entrepreneur, the story of Ken Olson and Digital Equipment Corporation. So this is an unauthorized book about deck. The thing that's really interesting about, I mean, there's a bunch that's really interesting about this book. It's like, it's, it's, there are reporters, uh, Glenn Rifkin and, and George Harar, they're, they're reporters. It's well researched, it's, uh, it's well written. Um, and the, um, it's written at the height of deck, like 1989. But in reading this, and so it's kind of like, especially with like the, the, the reason they titled it The Ultimate Entrepreneur is I think Fortune had named him The Ultimate Entrepreneur maybe the year prior, two the, years prior. The, the, the Entrepreneur of the Century. Entrepreneur of the Century in Ken Olson. And so you think like, okay, this is going to be kind of a hey, geography about uh, I'm literally checking every word I'm saying right now to make sure not like it's it's a geography, right? Can someone please? <laughs> I, I, I'm not brave no. enough to even attempt it. <laughs> right? Actually, actually, no, it's not. It's actually hey geography. Is that true? Yes. Get out. Get out. I'm, I'm but, really sorry. Find, find the true. button. There's a button here. <laughs> you could. You could. Uh, all right. Is this really hey geography? God, this is. A, I'm afraid to talk today. All right. Well, the, anyway, whatever. A, a a biography filled of nothing but praise. Um, but it's not. It's it, it is very much a warts and all view of deck. And reading that book, and it's obviously it's hard because we can't go back in time and read it in 1989 or whatever. But certainly reading it now, that book is like, wow, this thing was a time bomb in so many different ways. Like this was so, this company. There is so much that is deeply wrong in this company that it is of no surprise that this book that it is the height and it is kind of like the, a long descent from there. So, so the, the title was almost tongue in cheek. I don't think it was meant to be tongue in cheek. It's, it is not a takedown of deck. I think I it is really trying. That's part of what makes it good is it's trying to actually tell the story of deck, but it, it is, uh, it's just very revealing about a whole lot that is deeply wrong with the company when, I mean, so in particular, and there, there are, there are a bunch of things that we can kind of talk about, about what's right with deck and what's wrong with deck. And I know I've got a bunch of folks who, who have probably used deck systems or maybe even work for deck. So I want to get a lot of other perspectives on this, but one of the, and the, here's why I think deck is interesting. I mean, obviously I, I think computing history is, is always, I think history is interesting because I think it has a lot to teach us. I think deck is interesting because there, you know, why in deck is, is very much kind of rhymes with sun. Tom, obviously gonna be interested to get your perspective on this, but Deck and Sun both filled kind of similar cultural roles, but in different eras. And they were companies that people were rooting for that ultimately, even though they had a lot of success, like we talk about the failure of Deck and we talk about the failure of Sun, even though both, both these companies had like totally outsized success. And, you know, one of the things that like keeps occurring to me is like, why do we talk about the failure of these companies when they succeeded so much or they had so much success? And I think it's because because they were both at their core companies that were that were decent, that really had the, the engineer at heart, the customer at heart. And they were the companies that people were rooting for, that they wanted these companies to, to have even more success and, and kind of it, get kind of permanence and endurance. And even though both companies lasted a really long time, I mean, DEC is founded in 1957 and is, is acquired in 1998. Like, that's a long run. I know it's nuts. I, I I definitely want to talk up at some point about like the sun analogs because man, they felt really strong. But 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 before we do that, let's get to the rest of the list if if you think it's worth. Yeah, yeah sure. Off. Yeah, so let me just I'll, I'll, I'll rattle those off because then we'll, we'll kind of end up hitting on those. But so, all right, the Ultimate Entrepreneur, um, really good book. If there's one book to read on deck, it's that. That book sent me to a really interesting book written by the co-founder of Deck who is damn near written out of the history books as kind of told by Ken Olson. It's this guy, Harlan Anderson. And Harlan Anderson is really, I think, is, is, a, is a really interesting person. So he has, he has a biography, an autobiography, 
uh, called Learn, Earn, and Return. Not, can't, not a great title, but My Life as a Computer Pioneer. Um, and I, I loved it. I thought it was, it was very personal, and you can definitely see why he and Olson, why Olson ultimately forced him out. Um, and we can talk about that in detail. So that, that is really good. Um, and actually, so this is just a, a kind of an aside on this. So the book that I have is autographed by Harlan Anderson and it's made out to, to somebody it's made out to a name, um, to a Tracy Mackle. Um, and Tracy Mackle, thanks for the illegible best wishes, Harlan Anderson, January, 2010. And this is from the, it's a, a sticker from the senior men's club of new Canaan. It is new. Is it new Canaan? Is that right? Yes, right. Okay. yes, yes, yes. That's again, I need like a pronunciation guide and everything. Um, but it, it, which it was like super personal. And as it turns out, like this is a guy, he clearly he, this, this person, I found his obituary relatively quickly, lived in New Canaan and clearly knew Anderson. And, you know, I kind of had this, like, God, I've got this like a cherished copy that I bought for like a buck 98 on Amazon. And, you know, it's, it was almost like, sad in a way because clearly this guy passed away somewhat recently and you know his kids are probably going through all his books trying to figure out what to do with all this stuff so anyway i feel like i'm i feel like i'm a, a now a, a steward of this book that was clearly important to him um and that one is really really good i think um and then that led me to gordon bell's high-tech ventures the guide for entrepreneurial success which is a time capsule I would say that there's some good advice in it, but it is basically a time capsule and it's mainly capturing it's written in 1991 and it's very revealing. It's got some good advice in it. And then it's got some atrocious advice in it. Um, I tweeted something out. I just thing I tweeted out like last week about talking about the Japanese method of software. Did you see this? Oh yeah, I did see this. Yes. Very kind of cringy talking about how like software should be done in a big open room in the style of a factory and you should have thousands of people working on it and so on. And it, it, it contrasted with, you know, software engineers who want to see themselves as artisans and, right. and craftspeople and, right. and, and sneering at that notion. Sneering at that notion. Exactly. And kind of, th that's a reflection of kind of the, the early nineties. So that's actually, that's an interesting book and a revealing book. I don't know if I'd recommend it, but it, it's more of a time capsule. Then the, the book that I also have by Gordon Bell is computer engineering by Gordon Bell, which is it, it, it's C Gordon Bell which I, I know, I saw John Masters here. I'm, I, I'm sure that John's got a copy of this one. Um, that is a, I obviously see Gordon Bell, com indisputable computing pioneer, did a lot of incredible work. And that's him describing all these machines technically in detail, which is, was, is also really fascinating. That one, I did, I've not read cover to cover, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, and then the last book, and in some ways, in this one, I'm, I'm only about halfway through, but I, it, a book that you've got to read, you're going to love, Adam, is Creative Capital. And this is on Georges Dorio, the, the general, who is- And this, is, this was the, the first investor in, yes. in digital. Yes. I got you. This guy is amazing. Amazing. I mean, this is an amazing life. That, and uh, just exceptional. Really fascinating person. And one of the true pioneers of venture capital, I mean, arguably the pioneer of venture capital and really, really, really fascinating person. And I'm dying to know if our board member, Pierre Lamont, must have had, have intersected with George Dorio at some point. So I'm kind of dying to ask him that question, <laughs> trying to find the time, the right time to ask him that question. But I, it's a really good book. So there we go. Awesome. Yeah. And and what about the uh, deck is dead, long live deck? Oh yeah, the deck is dead, long live deck. I didn't mention that. Yeah, th then that was kind of the first one I read. Yes, and then we got deck is dead, okay. long live deck as well. Um, so by Edgar Schein, which is interesting because he was something who someone who worked with the company. So, so did you read that one, Adam? Have you? It, it, yeah, yeah, that's the one I read. Yeah, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I I I feel like it would. It's like the. Uh, if I got you know you and a couple other buddies together and we wrote the history of Sun, I think it would sound a little bit like that. I think you're right. So okay, yeah. So what do you mean by that? I agree with you. What, what do you mean? What what I, what I what I mean is it. I mean it felt. I mean maybe maybe I shouldn't include you and my other buddies who aren't very like uh, who aren't great writers maybe. But it, like it was <laughs> it was okay written. But but um, 
it was, you know, each chapter had like a slightly different ax to grind or a slightly different uh, perspective. And, and clearly some of them were stuck on the like deck was great. And like we crushed it and it was everybody else who was wrong. And all of our, it, you know, it, it felt like early chapters were sort of like making the excuses for failure. Um, it, in other words, maybe written by folks who were too close to it, both in terms of working there or around it and too close in time to be really objective. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also like, did you read Gordon Bell? So Gordon Bell has an appendix in that book. Where no, I did not check out the appendix. So I thought that was actually better than the book um, because wow. the, the, well, no, because the, one of the things that he says that I really disagree with is that deck failed because it didn't have the business gene. And I'm like, what does that mean? This like this company is bootstrapped in 1957. Yeah, I mean that was thematic throughout the book, and you're and you're right, sort of like, I don't know, antithetical with everything else. Yeah, I mean, I just don't know how you can accuse a company that has bootstrapped itself of not having of like not knowing how to run a business. It's like you can say a lot of things about that, but like I, I don't know, it feels like, and and Gordon Bell also calls that out, being like, I don't know, he's didn't have the business like that is that that was not the problem um but yeah so so where do we want to uh, um again i'd be curious if I, other folks want to jump in here with, with with their their memories of deck like why do we talk about it why is it interesting um i certainly have got my well some observations that i would like your perspective on adam in terms of like why i think and other people's perspectives on in terms of why i think it's interesting something about Olsen and then Olsen has got like, there's a lot to be said that's positive about Olsen. He's clearly like a, uh, he, especially in contrast to kind of today where there's so much distrust in executive leadership. He is clearly, he is someone who uh, does not live lavishly, who is not committing, you know, th this is not committing transgressions. He's not, you know, closing Bitcoin exchanges or what have you. I mean, he, he, <laughs> He, he's someone who who you would you would call decent, clearly, and, and in the way that the kind of the, the corporation's being run. Um, that said, though, he there, and I don't know how much this came through in Deck is Dead, Long Live Deck, but there is this very curious kind of juxtaposition between autonomy and autocracy in Deck. Do you know what I mean? Yes. No. Absolutely. And and this is part of what felt very familiar in Sun, but. It, and in terms of Olson's failing, it felt like it it sort of worked until it didn't, which is sort of a facile statement. But what I mean is like there, there came a certain scale or perhaps a certain kind of professional manager where the do the right thing started started being inwardly focused rather than like holistic. Totally. And in particular, one of the things that Olson likes to do it, that I think is nuts is he likes to have internal competition. He likes to have different groups competing with one another in, inside the company. And yeah, I think that that is, I, I think that that's terrible. I, I really do. I think that that is really, really, really toxic. I don't think that that works. I'd be again, curious if other people have got perspectives on where that has worked. But I don't. Well, I mean, I, I mean, that's that's like the AWS model, right? I mean, the, the, very overtly. Does, does Amazon? I don't know how much. Does, is that true? Does Amazon have a lot of internal that, competition? So I obviously I don't know because I've never been inside. But it does seem like, even within their service offerings, I mean, you see c competing and overlapping technologies, um, and you know that I, I think I've mentioned the Everything Store, uh, the biography of Jeff Bezos, it makes it seem like that is. Um, like a, a big chunk of what dro drove his management philosophy. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I I don't think that works. I think that that ends up creating a bunch of internal strife. You create, you're kind of constantly creating losers in your company. You're creating these battles, and you, you shouldn't assume that the best thing is going to win that battle. Um, and I don't know. It feels very um, having worked briefly at a company that really believe strongly in that kind of internal competition. I just saw how corrosive it was and it didn't, it, it, it kind of created a bunch of perverse incentives. I don't think it actually worked. 
Yeah, they, I mean, the description of deck what was, they kept on bringing up the term family and this notion of uh, lifetime employment. Yeah. Um, and, but it, it sounded like, a, a, you know, clearly he, he encouraged a lively discussion and heated discussion. But maybe, you know, if it rests on that foundation of like family and trust. And it's like, win, lose, or draw, I'm going to have a job in a, a year or two or six or 10 or whatever. Yeah. And maybe as that starts to erode, then also like the internal competition means like, you no, know, if I lose, like the con- there are more significant consequences for me. Right? That, that trust breaks down. Yeah, that's interesting. So, and, and kind of my view is that. The- that the, I think you're right. And I think that that's how he kind of pulls it off with this, like, you know, win, lose, or draw, you're going to have a job. But I also feel that, like, man, to have a project, and I know there are a couple people here who have had this happen in their careers, but, it, or maybe many, maybe all, to have a project that you've really poured your emotional energy into get canceled and kind of lose at the hands of a rival technology internally. You're like, I don't care if I got a job. <laughs> like that's, like, you know, you, you've taken so much of what's been meaningful for me for some period of time, and taken that away. It's like I don't, I don't want the job that's left here. And and people are leaving Deck like relatively early on. You know, I mean, so Harlan Anderson it leaves in I want to say '66. So he leaves. He is more or less managed out. He is saddled with. The, the PDP-6, one thing I want to say, as long as also, I, as long as we're talking about mistakes that I have made in talks, <laughs> I, I guess we're not talking about that, but maybe I'm going to mention that. This one is because this is also, this has been haunting me as I've like, I just feel like learned a lot more about deck. Like, I don't know, do the PDP machines blend together for you at all? <laughs> absolutely. As a much less attentive scholar to computer history, absolutely. And I don't know, like PDP-8, PDP 11, PDP 10, I don't know. I mean, these, these all seems like, you know, PDP 1, I don't know, PDP 3. Naming, PDP naming was not a strong point. <laughs> well, and, yeah, right. No, the name was a strong, well, so, and in particular, you know, I gave this talk. Actually, the last talk that I gave in person was, Adam, the talk that I gave about Oxide at Stanford. Oh, right. That was, that was like right before the shot. That was the end of February 2020. Yeah. And, the uh actually this is so they there's a lot that happened in that talk they invited me down to give this talk and then i got dry mouth in the talk have you ever had this happen to you (laughs) no but now looking back i do remember you just like desperate for every bottle of water in that room i was so i had told them before the beginning talk i really need water before i i talk and they're like we don't have time you have to start I'm like, I need water. Like, got to go. I'm like, I need water. I need water. Help. I need water. So I'm like, all right, I guess I'm going to do the best I can. So I started that talk, like, desperate for water. And at some point in the talk, I call out for water. I'm basically like, if someone has given me water, I, I had not had that happen before. But I'm like, I'm not going to be able to, like, open my mouth. So in that talk, I talked about the PDP-11, PDP-1170, and and how they have these like Raspberry Pi emulators of it, which is pretty cool. And someone was asking like, well, what operating system do you run on that? And I'm like, I don't know, like Tops 10 or whatever. I don't know. I, I volunteered Tops 10 as an operating system that one might run on the PDP 11, which I now realize is a like major faux pas. It, really? this, this, this is absolutely mind blowing. You didn't you didn't say Unix? Like no, Unix well, would have been. I, I was just, you know, I mean, obviously, like, Unix would be, I, but I was, you know, it was just trying to, like, be colorful, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not like I didn't know that, you, I mean, obviously, Unix ran on the PDP-1170, but the, I was just kind of throwing it, and I, so I say, I don't know, like, top 10, and the audience, which is supposedly a Stanford class, but basically consists of retirees that are local to Palo Alto, that just kind of, like, the, the audience absolutely jumped on me. It reminded me of when I was with a bunch of first graders and suggested that a dolphin was a fish accidentally, and then tried to take it back, and like all the first graders are like, a dolphin's not a fish! You, it's you, a you, you, like, you lost like, them completely. Right. I lost them completely. They're just like, who, who's this jackass? Doesn't even know that a dolphin thinks a dolphin's a fish. And the, I feel like the same way. So I'm like, I don't know, top 10. And literally like the audience like, top 10 never ran on a PDP 11. And at the time I'm like, what is their problem? And now I'm like, no, no, they were right. I was wrong. I should not have been suggesting that the, the Clearly, like, because the PDP-10 is a, like, a totally different 
machine in every capacity from the PDP. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, PDP, 10, PDP 10 was a mainframe. Right. Which, right. which I now appreciate. And so, Tom, did you work on a PDP 10? Uh, only very briefly. I was mostly PDP 11. It, because the PDP 10 plays a pretty interesting role in history that I guess I didn't fully appreciate. I mean, this is basically one of the very <clears throat> early time sharing machines. No, nah, well, it, it, it's a little more complex than that. The, the, the PDP-10 was the follow-on to the PDP-6, which makes no sense, because, like, the PDP-8, for example, was completely unrelated, right? And the PDP-6 was a follow-on to the PDP-3, right. I'd like to say. Well, you know, the, the PDP-6 was a follow-on probably to the PDP-1. PDP-3. Um, I, I believe you since you've just read the books, but, like, the critical thing about the PDP-10 was that that was like kind of the machine of the ARPANET early on. And, and, and a lot of the early internet work was done on that machine. It, like, right. it, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, yeah. It, and, and, it, it, yeah, in the late seventies, you were a nobody in terms of computer science if you didn't have a PDP-10, which was a, the problem at Princeton. We didn't have a PDP-10. And so what did you have in lieu of PDP-10, Tom? Well, we had the little PDP-11, which was a small machine that few people cared about. And we had the big old IBM systems in the computer center. That, yeah, so that, that is really interesting. And the, Tom, if I recall correctly, yeah. the PDP-10 and, no, and no ARPANET. And no ARPANET, interesting. And then the, the folks at Park coveted a 10, didn't have it. And Chuck Thacker built his, oh, that was the Maxi, right? It was not like a PDP-10. I mean, right, knockoff right. it was a PDP-10 clone. And St Stanford was a huge PDP-10 hotbed. A, a lot of a lot of machines that we think of as being sort of weird these days, like the early you know park machines and early list machines and so forth, a lot of those were almost directly inspired by the PDP ten. Yeah, that's interesting. And so the PDP ten is is killed very controversially inside a deck in I think nineteen eighty three, and that really rubbed a lot of people. Apparently, rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I don't know, Tom, if you had any visibility into when that was happening. I guess at that point, I mean you're already kind of starting at sun. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they were pushing the vax hard by that point. So there right. were just too many, too many things to keep alive. Right. And I think which kind of highlights, you know, the, the, all of this, this internal competition that they had for, for, and the, the, the kind of the PDB six even was kind of thought to be a dead end. And the part of the, the way they forced Anderson out, Harlan Anderson out is by saddling him with the P by having him run the PDP six, which everyone knows like, well, this is a project that's not going to go anywhere, but ultimately became the, the, the much more successful PDP 10. Mm. Dan, did, I mean, you never obviously worked on a PDP 10. This is just, I so did. Or not. What? How? I, I, I honest to God, I did. I mean, I, I didn't do a lot with it. Um, I was mostly famous for kind of getting inside of the system cabinets when, when folks were out of the room, and then when they came back in the machine room, I would jump out and scare them. Um, <laughs> but we, we, yeah, we still, we still had a PDP-10 that, that the system manager had gone to absolutely. This, we actually had a KA-1 or KA-10, excuse me, KA-10. And um, the system manager had gone to absolutely heroic lengths to keep this thing running. And university management was like, this thing's a power hog. We want to get rid of it. And eventually the paper tape drive that it booted from died. And so Brian, the system manager, built, uh, and you know, he was like, we need to fix the paper, paper tape drive on the PDP-10. And they were just like, no, we're going to finally get rid of this thing. And so this guy, who was actually an electrical engineer, sat down and built a compatible interface that talked to a serial port on one end and emulated a paper tape on the other. And then he wrote a daemon that ran on under VMS on one of the VAXs that when the PDP-10 booted up, you know, the, the sort of carrier sense line on the serial port would go high and he would just sort of squirt the bootstrap over it. And <laughs> he, he continued to be able to boot the PDP-10, and the and the, the administration was not amused. Yeah, how much virtualization of paper tape exists out there? That's gonna be that's gonna be somewhat unusual. That's amazing. Where was this? That was at Penn State University. I was in high school at the time, and I was kind of you know stealing some computer time from the local labs, and in return for doing some system administration work, they gave me accounts kind of everywhere. And the, the, the PDP-10 was esoteric, especially running TOPS 20. 
if you could find a deck system 20, which is running top, I'm, I'm sorry, the PDP 10 running tops 10 was very esoteric. If you could find a deck system 20 running tops 20, that's a much more reasonable computer. And that, that almost feels very familiar when you log into it. And then, so could you tell me more about this dreamlike description of you hiding in the cabinets? Adam, am I the only one that's getting an image of like <laughs> that's, Dan as like the, a, ghost, the ghost in the machine? <laughs> it was like a as like a PDP ten chimney sweep being I sent mean, in <laughs> for his. You know, <laughs> I was like sixteen at the time, and I was a lot skinnier, and, like, and these were you know these full height like six foot tall cabinets, and if I kind of just slouched a little bit i could basically stand inside of the thing and some of them had had all the electronics removed the cabinet itself was still there because nobody wants to move these racks around because they're heavy and stuff but like yeah i mean you could open up the it, it was an interesting machine because you could open up the system cabinets and you know it was it was all like discrete wiring especially on a ka and, and you could you know plug an oscilloscope into one of these things or apply a dmm and actually trace like what the ram was doing or you know right. what the CPU board was doing, or whatever. It was it was all very like accessible in that sense. Yeah, it's amazing. But the world was such lo that low speed world, and so I mean, this is but this is an old machine, obviously. By the time you're dealing with it, this is a machine. That's oh, probably oh, yeah, ten, ten years yeah. old. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 more than that. I mean, this machine was installed in like 1968 or something. Oh, wow. And you know, at, at this point, it's the you know, I was in high school, so it was sometime in the early 90s, probably like 93, 94. So, oh, wow. I mean, this machine's been in service for like 25 years. And, wow. you know, very, very few people are still using it, which was another reason the administration really wanted to kind of get rid of it. Um, but, you know, it was just like there was a small user base and the system manager was really into it. I mean, he really liked the PDP-10. He thought it was a great architecture. And, you know, he would just go to these heroic lengths. You know, it was like a ball would burn out on the, on the control panel or something. And he'd go in and replace it with an LED type thing. And so as sort of physical components on the machine were breaking down, they were being replaced with solid state electronics and, you know, that kind of thing. And so and were they running TOPS 10 on there? That ran TOPS 10, yes. Yeah. And TOPS 10 is – so you used – I mean, I've never used TOPS 10. But so you, this is like one of the first, I believe, uh, operating systems to really feature OS-based virtualization and other things. Um, I don't know that I would describe it as featuring OS virtualization there. So tops 20 included them. There was like some weird thing where you could basically boot. A that's, that's what I'm thinking of, right? That tops 20 could tops 20 run tops 10. Uh, kind of, there was like an, there was like a tops 10 emulator yeah, that sure. would run under tops 20. Right. If I'm re remembering correctly, it's funny. I have tops 20 running here at home. I should log in and just see if I can. <laughs> <laughs> As one does. Yeah, As one does. Yeah. And and then, but Tom, had you used so so you did you, you coveted the PDP ten but didn't have it. Um, and had you used the like the PDP eleven and its kind of successors or or any of the Vax machines or? Yeah. So um, I I got into Unix on the PDP eleven forty five. So that was nineteen seventy five, and then I was actually the sysadmin for that machine for a couple couple of years. And any and so uh, it, it was a very sweet machine. Yeah, I was gonna say like yeah, fond feelings of fond memories of that machine. Yeah, yeah, and I actually like the control the the panel colors even better than the eleven seventy. Oh wow, interesting. Yeah, the it, the thing that does seem of uh, Ken Olson as an engineer, the thing that seems to and I I, don't, I can't remember how much this this came through in the uh, deck is in the deck, but certainly in the Ultra Entrepreneur. And these other books, like Ken Olson is a packaging engineer, kind of this is his background. And it really does show in the, the kind of the, the, the product the, um, and just the, the packaging of the product is really, seems really good, durable. Yeah, definitely right. did, did not alluded to his engineering interest in Acumen, but not like that aspect of it. One, one of the interesting things is they, I don't know about, when they started, but the PDP-11 used the standard 19-inch relay rack, right, which we're all familiar with today. But yeah. I'm not sure when computers are using that. that That's was a good a, question. That, yeah, that the, was the, a telephone the, company thing. Yeah, right. The Kind of the first computers to be rack-mounted. Interesting. Yeah. 
uh, when and certainly the just the, the way you know the and you know we've got a VT one hundred in the office. I, I just think of the, a VT one hundred is just a beautiful piece of simple machinery. Um, I, I, I I'm sure that they are. Um, what what I mean, operating system does it run? <laughs> that is a good question. I, that is you know that's a, a question for Mr. Clulo. Dan, I assume that you've got a couple of, of VT terminals. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feel slightly embarrassed. It's like I swear I'm not a hoarder, but I, I like I definitely have a handful of vacs down in the basement and some VT terminals. They don't really run an operating system. I mean, there there was a uh, uh, no. yeah. I mean, they they basically it's microcontroller code. There's there's certainly a microcontroller inside of the thing, but that's not configurable or upgradable. You have to you only run one thing. Right? So I yeah it. yeah. I mean, it, like, like it boots off of a ROM and basically you know takes characters from a couple of different sources and and you know does something with them. It's it, it's a very very simple machine. Yeah, and that, then it, that was the later. I mean, the the early ones like the VT50. That was hardware. There was no. None of that microcode stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, and Dan, do you have any, I mean, maybe fast forwarding a bit to as things begin to kind of crumble inside a deck, do you have any of the deck PCs? I do not. No, that was, I, I never found that particularly interesting. I, th I think by the time I was, by the time deck was making really nice PCs, which they did kind of towards the end and, and sort of, the, you know, the, the the 90s um i was much more interested in machines that could run vms or unix and uh, like you know to say that you couldn't run unix on a deck pc is a little bit of a misnomer because you could install free bsd or linux or whatever on one um but like you know ultrix on the vac or, or sorry on the on the 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 deck station 5000 and 3000 model machines was actually pretty reasonable <laughs> and <laughs> OSF one on the alpha was my favorite version of Unix for quite a while. And the, so in OSF one is, as I understand it is kind of uh, Olson and Dex response to sun and attempt to, I, I mean, I think I didn't quite realize that the degree to which deck was a belligerent in the Unix wars. It, it, oh, it, God. Yeah. oh God. Yeah. I mean, look, here's the thing. Sun and AT&T get together and do Unix international and everybody else who was shipping Unix at the time was like, oh, shit, like, what do we do? I mean, this is it. Like, they're just going to take over the market. And so DEC and SGI and HP and IBM and I'm assuming a few other companies that nobody remembers anymore all got together and created the Open Software Foundation. And, Which, you know. And, and OSF also, also stood for Opposed Sun Forever. <laughs> <laughs> wow. God. The, the, yeah, no, but like OSF one was pretty cool. It, the the thing is, though, it, it was going to be this thing where I think HP was going to give the window system, and they did, and oh um, Deck was going to supply the kernel that was going to be mock based, or or CMU was going to do that, I guess. And like, so each company was going to kind of give their own little thing, mm -hmm. and then once they had a system that you know nominally worked. Like Deck was like, all right, we're shipping this on Alpha, and everybody else was like, cool, we're we're, we're not, <laughs> you know, except for IBM. IBM actually shipped OSF one on the mainframe. So was was huh. CDE on? I mean, the, the interface by HP. I mean, that's got to be the common desktop environment, right? Is that not? A... Yeah, so HP had something that I think was called HP View, that was the right, predecessor okay. of CDE. And God. that was kind of what they threw into OSF to, to you know, get to play in the party. But, and you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting question. I mean, why didn't IBM, for example, dump AIX? AIX was, was the weirdest, and frankly, it was kind of the least friendly version of Unix out there. You know, and OSF1 was, was just a much nicer operating system. Um, and Hockey Pucks was terrible. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I guess that's why they put them on the uh, HP's. Like, hey, what do we contribute? Like, hey, uh, how about you? How about the user interface? How about you? How about you do that? Uh, yeah. And the, the Unix wars, I feel, ultimately end or at least change tenor with the, the once the BSD case is settled and the kind of the rise of Linux and the open source Unices is kind of my read. On, I mean, the Unix wars, I feel, kind of predate me, but um, the I, I feel like the big thing that Deck 
seemed, and I've actually Tom loved your take on this particular, and Dan, yours as well, but the, it feels like what deck really missed was the rise of open systems. And similarly, I think, so they understood like great engineered, well-engineered systems, but did not see the value in an open standard. Well, they disparaged the PC, I mean, among other things, as like, I think Ken, uh, Olson's line was that uh, he would have fired the engineer who had designed it. Which is true. I mean, in that, <laughs> if, like IBM would have, if, if IBM had known, and there's like a weird, uh, th th this, this, this kind of weird circular dependency that if IBM had known how successful the PC was going to be, they would have put different people in charge of it. And they would have spent much longer on it, and it would not have been successful. I, I mean, like, right. Tech certainly had some of that, right? I mean, but, you know, like, so, so Tech is interesting because not only did they hate the PC, they hated Unix. Olson hated Unix. He, there, there's this great quote in one of the old iterations of the Fortune file where he's talking about sort of Unix documentation. And he's like, ha, Unix, you know, it's this toy system and look at these two little skinny books and yeah, they tell you everything you need to know to program the system, but like when you're ready to do real engineering, you're going to come over to VMS and you know, it, that, that's when it requires like a you know two beefy dudes to carry around this like six foot bookcase full of our manual set, just look at our documentation and the Unix people I think sort of wore that as a badge of pride they were like, my god I mean your system is so complex it requires a bookshelf to document, you know, ours is very simple and you have these two little sort of thin volumes but like Olson, he never saw the value in that. And he's, I think you, I think you hit it on the, on, on the head. He really did not see the value of open systems at all until it was just fabulously too late. Fabulously too late. And I, and, and the, the analog to Sun is Sun born on open systems, saw the value of open systems, but Sun didn't really see the value of open source until it was too late. I think. Sun also, you know, let's, let's be frank here. I think Sun chained themselves to Spark for just way too long. Oh, I mean, for sure. Did, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this is where like the analogs are really interesting. It's like, because Sun was kind of like, for Sun, uh, it shackled itself to Spark kind of the way Dex shackled itself to VMS. And uh, x86 at Sun was kind of playing the role of Unix at Dex. Like, we know we have to take this seriously, but we can't take it too seriously because we feel it undermines who we are. Um, so I, I, this is why there are all these interesting analogs, even though the companies are separated in time by, you know, 10, 15 years. Yeah. I, I mean, Sun, Sun lost control of the architecture and was eaten from the low end, which is kind of the same thing that happened to DEC. Absolutely. I mean, DEC, DEC really wanted to sell you a, a large form VAX, you know, what, what people used to call a real VAX back in the day. And I remember looking at a DEC catalog one time, sort of 91, 92, something, somewhere around there. And, you know, like like the cost of a VAX 9000, that, that was a million plus dollar machine. And I remember looking at sort of, you know, the performance numbers of the thing. And it's like, well, if I bought, you know, three micro VAX 3100s, like that's the same aggregate performance. And, and yeah. oh, by the way, VMS has like best and you know, arguably still in many ways has best in class clustering software. Like, why the hell would I buy the big machine when I can just throw another microvax into the cluster and, and, and get better performance. Like it, it made no sense. Yes. You know, so like just their product line was just totally out of whack with what the market was looking at. And they just, they didn't notice. They just, they, they, they could not rationalize that. Well, and, and then I think also you, because my view of deck, and I have to say this has been, um, my view going in and this view has, I would say been strengthened uh, having read now way too much on deck. Deck had way too many people. From the get-go, way too many people. And especially for a company that prides itself on lifetime employment, I mean, DEC had 120,000 employees in 1989. And that is, for, you know, an $11 billion top line, that is way too many people. And pe when you have that many people, it creates, I think you create so many problems because now you have implicitly created a, a high margin company. You can't actually do low margin things or lower margin things because you just have too many mouths to feed. And I feel like they've also, they created these kind of civil wars. And then they also invented matrix management. And, but that's like a good thing. <laughs> um, so, sorry, Tom, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just laughing at that. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, Olsen feels that he has this big breakthrough with the invention of matrix management. And this is part of the reason that, that Anderson leaves in 66 is because that he did, this is like madness where you have kind of everybody reporting into everybody else, but then you've got Olsen. And I think his view, which is, I don't think entirely cynical, is that this was kind of Olsen's way of retaining power over the company was by not letting any, any individual really be a logical successor. And by kind of assuring that there's this kind of constant feuding, I mean, the kind of the dark read on it is uh, this was his way of consolidating his own power. He definitely had a habit of anyone who he thought was getting too powerful inside a deck, he would, would be forced out because he didn't want to have his authority be challenged. And yet, yeah, kind of the, uh, sorry, talk good. Yeah, when in the early days of Sun, when people were coming from, from digital, I think they had already lost a lot of respect for Olsen. He was already in the autocrat mode. Yeah, that's yeah. Could you describe a little bit more about that? Because there are some early <clears throat> folks at Sun that were critical at at Deck. So it, it, Bernie Lacroute, is that right, Tom? Uh huh. Yeah. And, and did you? And, I mean, I mean, the company must have been. I mean, obviously, you, you, I assume, knew him at Sun. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he he was like our second VP of engineering. The first one didn't last very long at all. But uh, <laughs> Bernie lasted a long time, and I, it, I don't I don't remember what he worked on at Deck, but uh, he was he was the right mix of you know someone who knew what he was doing and able to handle a startup. So could you speak to that a little bit? Because he, the loss of Lacroote to Sun is definitely viewed as one of these kind of pivotal moments inside of Deck by everyone writing from the kind of the Deck side viewed that one as like a gutting loss and viewed him as really instrumental in helping to build the, the culture of Sun or helping build Sun. Is that, um, I mean, could you speak a little bit to kind of the way he ran engineering? Oh boy. Um, not really. I just know that he, <laughs> he, he ran it, which was given the growth rate. It was quite an accomplishment. Um, it's, yeah. So it, I mean, there's just so much shit going on. Yeah, but interesting. Everyone, everyone respected Bernie, and he was able to balance what must have been. It must have been extraordinarily manic in those days. With, with I mean, revenue was just oh, obviously yeah. exploding. Yeah, yeah, and with you know Bill Joy and Andy, you know, providing input frequently. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, my diet Dr Pepper almost came out my nose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious um, if any reason this idea of, of Olsen as an autocrat. One of the things I'm wondering if that sort of gives rise to are what is what I would call these sort of insurgency movements within Deck. And, yeah. you know, I'm thinking specifically of like you know, Mondo Stetner and the Unix people, um, because for instance, uh, I guess it was. Gatekeeper was was that the machine? Anyway, one of the early machines at Digital was like it was a super important Usenet and UUCP hub. Like everything. Yeah, deck, Deckfax. Yes, yeah. thank you. I mean, Bill, yeah, Bill Bill Shannon, who was number eleven at Sun, came straight from the Unix group at Deck, and so they were definitely a troublesome group for Deck. Yeah, they were, uh, Bell Labs bought a huge amount of machines to run Unix, but other than that, everyone hate, at DEC hated Unix. But there were like these, this group of guys who, I remember, it, it, I think it's in Salas's 25 years of Unix history, there's this sort of thing where at some point some accounting person comes to Stetner and is like, hey, you spent like $10,000 on, on phone calls to the West Coast last month. What, what is this? And he just sort of <laughs> said that like, Oh, the computers are talking to each other or something. And the person yeah, not, oh, okay. And like, <laughs> right. The number I saw pretty recently was a quarter of a million dollars. I don't know if that was a year or a month or whatever, but it was a lot of money. That's a pretty big matzo ball. I mean, I, I, and I guess the point is, like, 
even within this kind of autocratic environment, you have these people who are like, yeah, we're not going to kowtow to the party line. We're going to do our own thing because we think it's the right thing to do technically. And, and they weren't snuffed out, you know, and, and like that in 1982 or whatever, that's a pretty big line item for a telephone bill. Yeah. And I do think that that well. is that Dan, I think is a very good, this is where you get to the autonomy portion of this. This is what, what makes deck. So I think interesting, but also also himself a bit of a sphinx because you did have this autonomy and people were encouraged to do the right thing. It seems. And that certainly, I mean, I, I feel that cer- certainly son had that same culture. If that came directly from deck or not, but where you definitely had people, the boots on ground were very much, uh, in charge. I mean, I, I had said for years that that Sun's political model was like Somalia. It's like feuding warlords, and it couldn't possibly be federalized or controlled because the warlords were actually in charge. And if you wanted to get a food convoy through Sun Microsystems, you had to make sure that it was the the, the warlords you coordinated with. Um, and it feels like that uh, deck had that 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 kind of that similar. Uh, arguably autonomy to a fault. I think the thing that it was different is that there were more, it feels like there were more rival efforts inside of the deck. And then also just a lot more people, um, just an absolute ton of people there. Yeah. I wanted to cir- circle back and uh, another parallel between deck and sun was that they, they both made the computers that computer people wanted to have. Right. right? So they're addressing the technical markets and, there's no one in the right mind wanted would prefer an IBM to a, to a PDP in the seven days. Right. But everyone was forced to use IBM except for the lucky, lucky few. And was that, I mean, obviously I can envision many ways in which that was reflected, but was that, I mean, Tom, what were some of the, the kind of the dimensions in which this was a computer for computer people? Um, why? A lot of there was a lot of openness, um, so you know the Unibus and stuff like that provided a lot of interesting hardware variety. There was a range of operating systems, um, fair amount of customization possible. I don't know, just a lot of it also a lot of choice. The it machines also, were also really high quality computers. Right. I mean, yeah. I I every that's time I touched it. Every time I, I, I still have an alpha down in my basement that I recently had to replace a fan on because the fan died. And, you know, this machine was built in like 1996 or something. Right? And it's like still going strong and still running VMS. It's, it's kind of an impressive accomplishment in many ways. Well, and, and it's, I funny, can... it's funny because in my point of view, I, you know, the, the bar was set by, by deck. That was what I expected. And then when the PC came along, it's like, holy shit, how, do they, how, how are they getting away with this? <laughs> they being like the PC market. Yeah. How, like, like this yeah, is not yeah, good. right. Well, and you can right. see why it was really hard for, for Deck uh, to figure out how to enter that market. And obviously they entered it poorly. The thing that I think is interesting is they had three rival PC efforts inside of Deck. And they they released them all on the same day. So, uh, on purpose yeah. or by accident? <laughs> Apparently, it's on probably purpose. probably to mollify all of these competing groups. I think it was a bit to mollify the the, the competing group the competing groups. Um, and uh, the but it, it, it ultimately um, the, where there's a, there's a great line. Where um, uh, Olson called in Miller, Folsom, and Loveland, these are the three execs leading these three or three folks leading these three different teams to discuss the three headed monster, Dex low end strategy. I'm quoting now from, uh, from the old uh, he, he said, You know, I'd make it easy on everybody if I just said one of these products will come out, but I'm not going to do it because they do different things and the market will figure out who is right. And uh, Auburn Miller says, The market figured out who was right. And it was IBM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think this is where certainly the analog with, with Sun breaks down because I don't think we could have ever coordinated three different teams to launch <laughs> on the same day. Teams. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah, I, uh, no, I, I absolutely. We did, we, did, we did have three different architectures going for a while. We had oh, the, yeah, yeah, for sure. Sun 3, Spark, 
Sun three eighty six I. Yeah, I just mean you couldn't get those three executives in the in the room and decide and like agree on a date, and there was no leadership that yeah. would that would dictate it from on high. I, I, I kind of feel like another critical difference between Sun and Deck, it just has to be acknowledged. There's there was a coastal difference. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Oh, no, definitely. Yeah. Deck, Deck always struck me as sort of like the the nerdy engineer company, and and I mean, I mean that like in a, in a in a in an affectionate way. I, this isn't, you know, but like I think of Deck as like guys with black rim glasses that are taped together, kind of like mine. And, you know, maybe like button down shirts, but with like short sleeves and a skinny tie, you know, it's kind of that 19, early 1960s image of an engineer. And, and son was more like, you know, no offense, Tom, but I, like, 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 I know people were smoking weed in the parking lot. You can't lie. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> like, you know, or, or somebody was dropping acid or, some, or you know, I like that. It was, it was much more of like the hot tub at the, you know, kind of. Naked. It was so def- definitely, definitely the hot tub thing. This was, this was early '80s, pre-AIDS. Right, so right. Was, there was a lot going on. Yeah. So okay, so the hot tub thing is not merely like because certainly, Dan, I agree with you. When I think of like Silicon Valley in the early '80s, I feel like I'm in like Santa Cruz or Scotts Valley in a hot tub. Um, <laughs> and because well, uh, Stephen Levy's Hackers talks about this, right, where the um, the the uh, Sierra Online folks were constantly having these like wild parties in a hot tub. So, so Tom, this actually happened. This is not this is not merely apocryphal. These hot tub parties. Oh Sale, yeah. Sale had a hot tub at Stanford. I mean, it was like they actually had it in the AI lab. Was, yeah, that's not apocryphal. All right. So, uh, yeah, but was, I, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. I, I, I saw that hot tub, my one visit to the AI lab. But by the way, if you want some colorful history of the PDP culture around that time, log into a deck system 20 and run the bboard command, but print out all of the entries, including the very first one. And you will get some flavor. It, this is the goodbye message from the sale AI system. When they shut down the PDP 10, somebody wrote this uh, you know, rather long uh, thing that I guess was posted to Usenet or, or something, but it went into the Bboard file. Bboard was like a primitive bulletin board that kind of was built into top twenty. I mean, it's all yeah. well, type stuff. But um, well, it turns they, out uh, you know they they saved the backup tapes for the sale system. Yes, and somebody has somebody has restored everything, and it's online. But you you know the private stuff you still have to be the right user to get at. But oh, wow. one of the really one of the really interesting things is that Andy Bechtelsheim did all the design for the early Sun stuff on that system. So you can find the design files, you know, the wire, wire lists and all this stuff for the Sun 1s, Sun 2s, even some Sun 3 stuff before they, wow. they got off of that system. And that is a PDP-10? PDP-10, yeah. yeah. Wow. wow, that's amazing. Uh, Matt, you had your, your hand up. Yes. Uh, yes. So um, um, I'm I'm young enough that by the time I was aware of deck, it was well and truly in decline in the, the mid 90s. But uh, I you guys were talking about uh, deck, uh, various deck hardware that you've owned. And I uh, briefly owned uh, a piece of deck hardware that I bought off of eBay about four years ago. And that was the Deck Talk Express uh, speech synthesizer. Huh. So this was um, this was basically a a portable uh, box that could you know, run off of a battery and and uh, hook up to a, a computer th- through a serial port, and it was running the Deck Talk software on a on a three eighty six, from what I've read. But the thing that I thought was interesting about this, and, and I, I bought this hardware for the specific uh, purpose of, you know, I, I wanted to donate it to the Living Computers Museum in, in Seattle, because this was while I was at Microsoft. And I, I thought this museum was cool, but it should, at least one or two of the computers there should be accessible. So anyway, uh, like accessible for blind people. But uh, anyway... The thing I 
found interesting about this hardware was the serial port connection was uh, uh, the, the port on the deck talk express box was not a standard RS two thirty two port. Deck had, right. Yeah. MMJ, the modified modular Jack. Is that, is that what it stood for? I believe so. It, yeah. It was like, I think it was like similar to an RJ 45 uh, RJ RJ eleven is probably the closest, but yeah, uh, it, it has the offset clip, which is offset. So I had to buy another adapter off of eBay, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. But I thought uh, this is uh, weirdly proprietary. I guess this is product weirdly proprietary. I okay, so I have no idea about this thing. I'm on the Wikipedia page now for the modified modular jack, and they, honestly. Adam, have you seen this thing? If I saw this jack on the back of the machine, I would assume that you were pranking me. Like, <laughs> what the hell is this? <clears throat> they use, oh, man. Sir, sir, serial ports have a sad history. I, I used to complain at Sun that every hardware engineer had to des design his own serial port connector. Yeah, well, it, it, it does feel horrible. like it's the the apple of its day in terms of like, what, I need another dongle now? It's like, okay, Jesus. Oh, but it, right. Like, in fairness, DEC used that for everything. So, like, the later model VT terminals all have an MMJ connector coming out of the, coming out of the back. Yes, I have definitely bumped yeah. into this in, uh, in Brian, the, in the Brown CS computer lab. The, the terminals there had this weird thing. You're right. Right, right, right. Right. Little did I know that I was... Uh, it, it, yeah. It's kind of like the, the Cisco standard for serial ports on a RJ45. Which is and, you know, propagated around lots of places. And by the way, Matt, yes, would, the Deck Talk Express that I bought off of eBay was functional. I, I yeah, think well, there was yeah. some problem with the battery holding a charge, but I did get it working with my modern computer via a USB serial adapter. And some kind of, somebody wrote an add-on for the NVDA Windows screen reader to make it work with Deck Talk Express. But uh, yes, it was functional. That's very really cool. And actually, Matt, I was thinking about that as I was, because I, I remember you had mentioned that in the, the uh, when we did the space <clears throat> on accessibility. And, and I, I mean, I think you had said that, you know, this was way ahead of its time and, and really remarkable engineering. And they'd done a lot with a very small amount of, of RAM and other resources. Um, well, yes, original deck talk came out in 84. And I, I heard from one of my colleagues at Microsoft that the original Deck Talk was using a 68,000 processor, and then Deck Talk Express was much later. I think it was late 80s or early 90s and was specifically designed for accessibility applications you know, to be hooked up to like DOS PCs. Interesting. Yeah, that would, but another... Uh, degree in which the deck was i mean again like like so many times was was way way ahead of its time uh speaking of sort of text-to-speech um peripherals uh lauren de cherry recently passed away she had been a researcher at uh, bell labs working with the unix group in 1127 and she had written a text-to-speech program that uh, plugged into some sort of uh, speech synthesizer that they had, and I don't recall exactly what model it was. But again, that was hooked up to a deck machine. You know, all of that work was originally done on Digital Equipment Corporation computers. And one of the, one of the sort of funny stories about this, and this is secondhand, but I don't think I'm betraying any confidences here, is that somebody went into the lab one night very late, and they heard this sort of computery voice coming from down the hall saying, fuck, fuck. Fuck. And they went into this office and found Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie basically teaching the computer how to swear. It's <laughs> like, what are you going to do with it? And there was just had this string of obscenities coming out of the thing. So, you know. This is like the Microsoft Tay circa <laughs> 1970s era Microsoft Tay. Well, I, uh, I, I, with, with the role of 4chan being played strangely <laughs> by, by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, that might be a little bit of a stretch, but you know, maybe not too much. Uh, so one more thing about deck talk, if I may. Um, so when so d you guys said deck got sold to Compaq in in '98, right? Um, so when deck got sold, deck the ownership of deck talk then changed hands a few times over the past few years, 
but I don't know if this is coincidence or not, but deck talk, uh, the, the, the quality of deck talk really suffered um, starting right around the time that deck got sold. It's um, amazing. <laughs> the last good version of deck talk, in my opinion, was version 4.50, which is late 90s. And uh, in fact, when, uh, when, I was, when I was working on Windows accessibility soft, well, at, at one point I was working on, an, on a product that ran on both Windows and Linux uh, around 2004. And uh, our primary speech synthesizer was Deck Talk. And uh, going back and forth with the then current owners of the technology, we were able to dig up version 4.50 for Windows, <laughs> but we could not get a good version for Linux because by the time it got ported to Linux, it had already gone to shit. Good, so. Yeah. Well, acquisitions will do that to you. Um, Simi, yeah. I see you got your hand up. Before you do, um, Tim, I saw you jumping in here. Um, it, it, it's been a long time. How are you? Not bad. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Absolutely. Yeah, so I worked for DEC between 81 and 83, my first job out of university. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, just this was when the Vax tribe was winning the wars against the DEC System 1020 tribe. It was, it was, it was uh, ugly. But I just wanted to tell you a funny war story, which I thought might amuse a couple of people. So I was working up in Canada. And so they took us on a tour of one of the factories where they built the PDP-11s. It was up in Ottawa. And so they had this big factory floor full of these wire wrap machines. And there were immigrant women. <laughs> they were all immigrant women sitting there in front of these things, you know, putting a wire on two of the connectors on the back of the, of the motherboard um, by hand. One, 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 one. And this is how the computers were being built in about 1982. Fairly astonishing. But then... Then they said, well, you should see how we do it in the future. So they went over to the place where it was being done automatically. And what they had there were these huge robot machines. And I think there were six of them. And each of them had two arms that held a motherboard and then uh, moved it around. And at the same time, two other arms came in and plonked a, a wire between two of the connections. And it was, it was really pretty fast, boing, 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 boing. So they were building those you know, at great speed. And then after they said, would you like to meet the guy who wrote the code that does that? And we said, yeah, sure, that'd be fun. And so they took us to this guy. And he was in a room off to the side. And, and, I, and we said, well, how does that work? He said, well, it runs on this PDP-8 here. And we were shocked. I mean, because the PDP-8 was not much of a computer. And we said, well, I mean, how can that possibly work? He said, oh, it's okay. We don't have any operating system to get in the way. Huh. Nice. Well, and the PDP-8, as I understand it, Tim, was used in a lot of these kind of industrial real-time applications. It was a 12-bit computer, and, uh, you know, and I can't imagine what the clock speeds were like, <laughs> but, you know, not fast. Um, and, uh, yeah, they sold tons of them, and they also had this, this really successful line of dedicated word processors at one point. Um, and those were all PDP-8s inside. And, you know, on the famous launch of the three deck PCs in 82 or whenever that was, um, one of them was a PDP-8 word processor. Is, so is this, I, I is this DeckMate, Tim? I believe that's yes. correct, right? Nice, great. Uh, yeah, this is. I wanted to tell the worst. Wanted to tell the worst story. Well, that's a great war story, Tim. And I believe it was the Deckmate Two was the so that was the, the kind of the three uh, the, the three rivals I, are the the Deckmate Two, the Pro Three Hundred and Fifty, and then what is effectively a Deck PC, uh, the Rainbow. Um, yep. Terribly, terribly named. Um, and those are obviously all three perished. Um, well, the guy, but, the guy behind the rainbow was Barry James Folsom, who then uh, came over to Sun to do the 386i. Oh, interesting. So he should have he should have learned his lesson, but yeah, you know, we had to pr produce our own non PC compatible. So. And it, it, Tim, this, your story does actually, because one of the things I've definitely wondered, especially, you know, is we've got, I mean, obviously we're making machines and uh, I mean, it was really mesmerizing when we were doing board bring up, they got the, the, the flying probe that tests all these different connections and watching that thing zing through all this, you know, watching these pick and place machines. And you realize that like Moore's law has absolutely played a role in the way we manufacture computing. 
And we were able, we were able to make computers better because computers themselves were getting better. I mean, there's was, there was a, a very important role that computers were playing in the making of computers. And Tim, like, it sounds like you're right on the coalface of that, of the PDP-8. Can't disagree. But going, going, back, going back to the PDP-8 thing, you know, there, there's kind of a lost art of being able to write standalone programs, which were fairly common back in the day. If you had some simple task to do, you know, who needed an operating system? Oh, well, you know, we we do this with bare metal Rust. We do this with you know, this is the the beauty yeah. of no standard in Rust, right? Is that you actually it's kind of bringing the lost stars back in a little bit. Yeah, but um, uh, one of the, one of the really beautiful books from Deck from the PDP eight era, I think it's called the Small Computer Handbook or, or something like that. But but basically, it starts with. Here is the definition of a bit. It can be a one or a zero. And by the, by the end of the book, you're writing a Fortran compiler that runs on the PDP-8. That's really it, cool. It just, walk, it just walks you all the way up the stack. It's amazing. That it, is really, yeah. We would be remiss if we didn't mention the PDP-7 in this conversation. Since that was yeah. actually the first machine that ran what became Unix. And the first identifiable version of Unix was written for the PDP-7 in assembly language. And that is an interest. If you ever get a chance to use PDP-7 Unix, it's actually kind of cool. Like, it, it, it's different, but you can recognize it. Yeah, I was amazed they got that up and running at, at the Living Computer Museum. That is really cool. So, and Tom, the PDP-8 small computer handbook is online. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, it is. It, it is really cool. This is really neat. I was like, I, you know, a question I definitely have is like, if you were to teach a course on this today, I think it would it still be very pedagogically valuable, actually, even though plenty of it is antiquarian. Plenty of these abstractions are obviously remain the same. Yeah, um, yeah if, if, if you're the type of student who wants to learn from the bottom up, it's, it's amazing stuff. It is amazing. But, stuff. If, it, but cool. if you're a top-down person, it's like, why are we doing this? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, the, all, everyone in these photographs is dead. Um, uh, Simeon, you had your, your hand up for a while. With the, uh, sorry to short circuit you there. I'm not sure if Simeon is still there or not. You may have given up. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yep, we can hear you. Um, yeah, so I guess with the clock speeds now, you get that, you know, Everything is analog. Problem is is uh is is more relevant now than uh you know when when people were running things on on PDPs. Um, two comments. So the one was you you mentioned this intern, internal competition in a company thing. Um, I would say probably the modern case study might be looking at Cisco because they do a lot of that. Um, perhaps uh, one difference is they have. They have business divisions that focus on specific markets. So they start out not necessarily competing. And then they try and attack each other's markets, which is kind of weird. Um, so that was a comment. Uh, the thing that I wanted to ask is, so my, my sort of only proper experience with, I guess it would have been Compaq at that point, was um, working on alpha machines. And in fact, one of my first kind of student jobs at university was um, together with a mate being a sysadmin for um, at one of the very late alpha machines at the point where, um, where uh, Compaq had struck a deal with Samsung to start manufacturing motherboards in kind of PC form factor, and you could buy essentially a clone, like an alpha clone. Um, and there was a theoretical physicist at the physics department that he wanted to run um, Mathematica. He wanted to teach a course with Mathematica, and he wanted a real machine, which meant a 64-bit machine. Um, and so... My mate and I, we, we were the sysadmins. We ran an early Red Hat that was actually shipped, um, compiled for Alpha on that machine. And I felt like they had a bunch of ingredients and they had good timing to really have a high-performance processor, which ultimately failed um, you know, comp, you know, against x86. But it just seemed like a shame. Like It ran open source software. It kind of had the PC model. Um, it was high performance, it was 64 bit, and yet it failed. And, and I'm kind of curious if anyone has insights as to you know, why that happened. What, what, what killed Alpha, you know, even though um, DEC was pretty much dead at that point? Was well, I think that that's probably, that's probably part of it. 
So I can tell you that a bunch of the alpha architects and the alpha folks came to Sun after alpha. So I actually worked somewhat closely with the guy who'd been the lead architect on alpha. And because he was the, he was one of the, the three architects on millennium um, inside of sun, very bad to name a, when it was like 2003 and we were still working on millennium. That's like a bad sign. It's the danger of like, it's like name, you should not codename your microprocessor after a year, unless you are absolutely certain you're going to stick your date. Um, but the, what he had told me, his perspective on why alpha had failed was, uh, deck had very bad marketing. And I remember thinking that is definitely not it. Um, I felt, I, I mean, I felt that everybody had heard of alpha. I thought alpha had had a, I mean, organically, not because of reading, but it had a terrific brand, a brand that meant performance. I remember thinking like, don't you think the problem was like that there were no apps? I mean, that feels like the absence of software really was more of a problem. I, I don't think it was that. I mean, like alpha, al fundamentally, alpha was too expensive. It, it was a great yeah. architecture, but it cost, it, it was, it was, you know, double the cost of x86 or whatever, or four times or however much more expensive it was. And, you know, the, the corresponding increase in performance was not, that high um you know you were paying four times as much for a processor that was twice as fast i mean just buy two x86 processors or hell buy four of them and you get an aggregate system that's four times faster that i think had a lot to do with it alpha as an architecture did some weird stuff i mean it was effectively a word oriented machine with special instructions to access bytes all that was byte addressed um and then there was like some weird stuff with the memory model. It was like uber relaxed. If you read the RCU papers, it's the only one where in the read path, you actually have to like do something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was, it was just a strange architecture. And, and I think that had more to do with it. You know, like the I, alpha was canceled for a reason. And, and it wasn't that it was unsuccessful commercially. It was, it was, they had pushed the architecture about as far as they thought that they could reasonably push it. Yeah, the well, and and Alpha also served as the foundation for Piranha, which I thought was I I think is the first multi-core design, certainly a very early one coming out of Deck World, um, and I felt like that could have been a very I mean, obviously, it was the path that ultimately all of computing went, but Deck was definitely there first or very very early with with Piranha. I think part of the reason that the, I mean, I do think that the failure of Deck is really tied up in the failure of alpha i think by the time alpha came out deck as a, as a vessel was in deep trouble well, i i would i would put the back 9000 as, as more of the root cause there. that's fair yeah okay that's yeah the vax 9000 was also a obviously a complete disaster tom what's your perspective uh that was all after the time when i was paying attention to deck but but uh the, in, i like to say there were three phases at sun there was Beat, beat Apollo, and we pulled that off. Then there was Beat Digital, and we pulled that off. And then there was Complete Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> and we pulled that off, too. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I was just there. I think I came for Complete Chaos. I guess I showed up for yeah, Complete yeah. Chaos. Um, the, uh, I, well, I actually think that there was, a, there was a Beat IBM, for sure, inside of Sun. Um, well, there, there was also a Beat Microsoft inside of Sun, too. Yes. Um, but right, and, and a beat, beat Intel and a right, beat which, anyone. Hence, and, hence complete chaos because there's right. the, the shifting targets. I, I, I posted that graphic a couple of weeks ago. That was pretty hilarious. But which one was that? This, um, this, it was a, somebody did a cartoonish thing about all the directions Sun was trying to go and how screwed, like, screwed up things were. Yes, yes. And, uh, it's pretty funny. Yeah, and I think that, like, you know, we to, to a certain degree, it's it's that that chaos is a luxury of having. I mean, when you have, are a profitable company, you got the luxury of chaos, and Deck yeah. had, had that luxury. When you when you're trying to beat Apollo, you just you don't you don't have. I mean, you've got necessarily you've got a lot of focus. And oh, yeah, and, probably, and, and, uh, sorry, uh, and I can probably thank that for Deck Talk. The, the, right, exactly. No, absolutely. Yeah. No, no question. And, and, uh, lots of things inside of Sun too benefited from the chaos and from from the autonomy 
um, the, 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 lots of great ideas came out because of that. So like, there's there's something to be said for it. It's just that it, it's uh, it, there's also obviously a, a real danger. I think one of the things that is very clear is that Olsen needed to have left Deck earlier. I think that it was going to be very hard for Deck to survive with Olsen in place. He'd just been wrong about too much and had driven too many people out. Yeah, and I think there was a bit of a, a transition problem at Sun as well, where uh, yep. I'm not saying that Scott should have left early, earlier necessarily, but clearly the transition didn't like take us where we needed to go. And yeah. it felt very familiar at, at deck where he, he pushed off. And as you say, he kind of consolidated power and made sure there was no clear number two until much, much, much too late. You know, I was out in the field then. And I think one thing that was really very, very bad was out in the field sales organization. They were completely 100% obsessed with, with IBM and quite convinced that if deck just became more like IBM, then everything would be okay. And they kept bringing in these mid-level doofuses from IBM and putting them in important <laughs> jobs uh, and, and assuming things would fix themselves. Now, at that point, you got to realize that, that IBM was like 10 times the size. And so the phrase was, well, you know, IBM is growing at one deck per year. How can we win? Well, we got to be more like them. And it just didn't end well. And that does not end well. And it, Tim, that goes to like, the, again, the, the kind of the, the, my like fundamental belief of more people, more problems and deck had way too many people. You need to have you should have a tenth the number of people that they had, or or, or a third, uh, and f force the company to focus a lot more. Um, it, it just felt like it, they were creating so many of these problems. And the idea that like headcount is a goal in and of itself to me uh, is just anathema, which yeah. I believe I am pronouncing correctly. But now, but today, well, that, well nailed it. One of the uh, local symptoms of that internal competition stuff was the DEC Western Research Labs versus DEC SRC, two different research centers, two miles apart, in total <laughs> antipathy among the groups. It's, okay, I did, so I don't think I realized that. So DEC World and DEC Cirque were, I, I knew that they both existed. I don't think I realized that they both existed at the same time. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And Cirque, Cirque, Cirque was the former Xerox Park people. But I think overall, I think WRL did a lot more interesting product stuff. Yeah, I want to say that, that I think Piranha actually came out of Whirl. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there was definitely some interesting stuff happening. I mean, and I mean, like Sun, where you had different, you know, rival labs as well. Yeah. You know, they also had Alta Vista. If they'd been a little smarter, they could have been Google. Well, that's it. Yeah. I mean, it, and they had, so, I mean, Tim, they had all, and actually I remember when I knew someone who had gone to Google very, very early. I had never heard of the company before um, and thought that the name was dumb and that the idea was dumb because why would you have a search engine when we all are using AltaVista, which of course was, so it, 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 Tim, it's kind of hard to remember. I and mean, that was like, that was the late nineties, right? I thought 98, 99, the search engine of choice was, was AltaVista for everybody. I mean, yeah, not, only, not only yeah. did they have Alta Vista, they had Jeff Dean and Sanjay at the same time. <laughs> so, like, they had some of the core people at the heart of early Google um, within the building, and they weren't able to, you know, effectively deploy them. Okay, so here's the question, though, for you. So wow. for, was DEC ever going to make it? Because I kind of feel like the... I don't know, Tim, what you feel about Sun, but I, I, I kind of feel like... You know, you can talk about, like, how could you have righted the ship at deck or how could you have righted the ship at sun? But I also just kind of feel like, actually, the the ecology of Silicon Valley requires forest fire to have actual new new birth. And actually, these companies had to burn to to, to release their – to release the Jeff Deans back it's, into new enterprises where they could actually build something new. It's just so – it's so hard to be able to navigate – a technology change as fundamental as what DEC was going through, right? Where they had to throw away that, you know, big metal time-sharing business model that was their golden goose. They had to redirect funds away from that and pick what the next thing was. And there were a few people in the building who were trying to do that. They knew what they what the right thing was to to try and fund, but they just could not effectively you know, shift the the ties of the company towards that. Um, you were talking about uh, Bernie LeCruc earlier 
and he has a oral history on the computer history museum's Ooh. YouTube channel. And looking through the the transcript, there's some interesting stuff in there about his, you know, decision to leave deck and, and join some. Oh, there, that's I, I, so. Just a quick pitch for those. I, Adam, have you listened to any of these oral histories? Yeah, um, the one from Pierre Lamond, and then I think one or two others as well. The they, Dave Cutler one. The Dave Cutler one is a very good follow up. The Dave the Cutler one is a very good follow up. It is a very good follow up. It's a two parter, and my I I just had that on whenever I was in the car. The Dave Cutler one. And my kids just got used to like, all right, if I dad's gonna give me a ride, I gotta like, listen to this guy for fifteen minutes talk about. But it was, it's really good. Um, it, it, and no, those are um, highly recommended. Um, the the one with Pierre is terrific. Um, I don't think Pierre realized it was going to be publicly available, um, which makes <laughs> it <laughs> because I in my first meeting with Pierre, I referenced that. And he's like, how do you know that? I'm like, because, well, there was this oral history. He's like, did they make those available? And, and I, I think like, that he, oh, oh, do you regret taking swings at all the people you did? <laughs> well, and the thing that's funny is like, this is literally the venture capitalist behind YouTube who is, is just surprised that it's online. Um, and, but the, I think that these oral histories are marvelous. And I, I can't, I missed the Bernie LeCruit one. I, you know, I can't wait to check that one out. I, I wish they would turn them into like a podcast format because it'd be a lot easier to consume than YouTube. But these are really uh, must watch. Uh, I, the Dave Cutler one is great. Um, I, the other one, so another character, and actually there's a there's another book that I've actually got on the queue now as a result of all this, Adam, and I made reference from earlier. This guy, Avram Miller, is actually a really fascinating person who is at deck on one of these rival of uh, one of the three rival efforts he's on the the pro 350 side he's he leaves deck and he ends up starting intel capital um but there's a really good oral history with up uh, with Alfred miller as well so anyway sorry dan i know i cut you off i just wanted to make the plug for the computer history museum oral histories no that's i mean that those those things are awesome no no problem at all i i wanted to make two sort of quick points about this question of did deck have to fail so Gordon Moore wrote a retrospective, um, <clears throat> I guess, after he left digital. It's available on his website. And uh, he, Gordon Moore Gordon, or, or, or uh, Gordon Bell? Uh, sorry, Gordon Bell. Excuse me. Um, and I, 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 posted, I posted a link to this on Twitter the other day. And it's kind of fascinating. He basically made this argument that, like, look, if DEC was going to survive, DEC was going to have to transition from being a hardware company to a software company. Yep. And he's, nobody has ever done that successfully except for IBM. And, and, like, and, and they just could not pull that off. And I think that really dovetails nicely with these things about like, hey, they had Jeff, they had Sanjay, you know, they had Alta Vista. Clearly people were thinking about those things. Well, those are all fundamentally software projects, right? And if you're a hardware company, you're like, well, that's cool that our research guys are doing that. But like, whatever, who cares? Like, we need to ship more alphas or, you know, people still want to buy the Vax or hey, what's up with this titanium thing? I mean, you know, there are all these sort of questions that come down the pike about that kind of thing. And then sort of the other thing that I wanted to mention, if it'll come back to me, because I've, of course, forgotten what it was I was going to say. Um, never mind, I forgot. And it, 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 it'd be interesting to know if this is the same, um, because again, he's got this kind of this this uh, eulogy for deck in Deck is Dead, Long of Deck, that I think is actually very interesting. <laughs> And it, yeah, the, the, those those are the same same thing. The same oh, okay. thing, yeah. Hey, yeah. Brian, can I can I jump in? This is Shaheen. Sure, Shaheen. How are you? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Dan's been suffering me for the past couple of days on this Gordon Bell <laughs> thing <laughs> because I totally disagree with it. I think oh, interesting. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I've been trying to make a case, and you know, Dan's making a great counter case, and I think we're having a good chat. Oh yeah, I, absolutely. I think the biggest mistake with these companies, Sun included, is that they abandon their installed base. Yeah, sure. they lose heart. They 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 sort of get tired of it, and they think that it's a losing battle, so they throw in the towel before they actually have lost the game. And yeah. the contrast for that actually is the IBM mainframe. Is that in the you know thirty years ago, in like the early nineties, IBM mainframe was called dead. And their management was actively trying to kill it. And then Lou Gerstner gets appointed. And then he looks at the books and says, what's the problem? 
you know, we have an installed base. They want more mainframes. They're going to give them more mainframes. And 30 years later, it's still by itself about a $2 billion product plus carries a whole bunch of other storage and software and services and ISVs, et cetera, et cetera. And over 30 years, it's provided probably billions of margin dollars that have enabled IBM to become a software company. So I think Deck's biggest problem was that they abandoned VAX. It was a cult following. You never abandon a cult following satisfied installed base. That's a sin. And frankly, Sun did the same thing. For four yeah. years, I couldn't even find hardware on the website. It was all kind of, you know, the new and shiny object like the uh, pie chart that, that, uh, that, that Tom shared. So I think that's the major sin is that they chase markets that don't exist and they abandon the market that does because it's not as cool as it was before. Yeah, I, 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 I think you're totally right. And, and both these companies were addicted to super high growth new markets kind of stuff. Whereas, you know, IBM stuck to their knitting and was able to, to grow that. Right. Even though so, in, the 90s, in the 90s, the mainframe was the worst possible price performance. It's just really bad. Well, that's interesting because I, I do feel, I mean, I have to say, having read especially Harlan Anderson's take on Ken Olson in the mid-60s, the question for me is not like how did DEC fail, but how did DEC possibly succeed? Because it is such a, again, when they kind of invent matrix management and it is just a total clusterfuck inside. And I, I think that part of the way they did that is that they, in Sun 2, when you're sitting in this super high growth market, it's able to cover up a lot of sins and you don't have to be very operationally superlative and you get to have way too many people and you all of these things that aren't issues when you have to go into a market and fight a lot more honestly um I, so yeah i think that's interesting that they they kind of uh i also feel that like you should never i feel uh the, the kind of the customers that brought you there you want to be sure that you are never denigrating those customers. And I do feel that Sun did that um, a bit. I think Deck definitely did that. Um, I noticed that like Amazon really does not do that to their credit. That's something that I think Amazon gets indisputably right. Uh, oh, Amazon. Amazon is also young compared to all of these companies, right? I mean, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, yeah. Less every day, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, young-ish, right? I mean, Amazon was like 97, 98, something like that. And, you know, we're now, I mean, it's, you know, they're a quarter of a century down the track. So it's not. Eh, um, okay, that's fair. Yeah, but I mean, it, but they, they are way, way past, way away from the center of the curve. Most software companies can't keep an API the same for two years these days. And, you, you know, I kind of feel like that, you know, Amazon has got, I mean, obviously, you know, Tim was on the, was, was famously, infamously on the inside there and can, and can speak to this. But I, I, I feel that the, Amazon does a superlative job of, if you're a customer building on Amazon APIs, you know that thing is going to be there forever. You're not going to have to wake up one morning to someone's OKR was to rip your thing out, which I feel it is, is, a, uh, is a persistent fear uh, for those using anything from Google, yeah, I, I, AWS in particular is uh, not only you know pretty good about keeping things around; they're smart. Like there was the infamous uh, AWS Simple DB, which um, you cannot find on the website; it's not there. You cannot sign up to join it. But there is a big swath of happy customers who still use it every day and a team that supports it. Um, pulling that off is hard, but you know it 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 it, it really works well for them. Yeah, and I think it just takes, I mean, certainly from the outside in anyway, it, it, there's, I mean, Amazon has got uh, certainly an operational culture that was does not present at, at DEC or Sun. Um, they, they, no one would accuse them of not having the money, Gene. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unlike DEC, which is what, you know, the, the, the theme here. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, what, you know what, though, like, like I, I remember the thing I wanted to mention earlier, which was this video. It's a video that's a series of interviews with Olson interspersed with other things about digital. And it was made probably sometime in the 80s. And it's quite fascinating. I actually think that in many ways, one of the things that made digital successful was that they, they had such amazing engineering. And I think that one of the things that killed them was that in some ways, they were too far ahead of where they should have been. Like they, you know,
they have a vision of this completely networked world where you would have various size systems, all of which were Vaxxin or whatever, but, you know, I mean, still, you would have sort of a workstation that a manager or an engineer would sit in front of with a graphical display. There would be serial line terminals and concentrators and so forth that would be on, like, the manufacturing line. There would be large Vaxxin sitting in data centers acting as servers. All of this stuff was going to be tied together with DECnet. It was all very interactive, networked, and so on. Like, nobody was really thinking. Of, I mean, Sun was, to their credit. But, you know, that, that was just, IBM wasn't really thinking about that in those terms, nor was anybody else in the industry. It was, it was a very, like, dynamic environment that they were envisioning. And I, I, I think that they just weren't, they were too early. They couldn't pull that off. Well, and I think if you're going to be that early, I think you can be that early. But if you're going to be that early, you need to be willing to really grind and do some things that you may not want to do to get these things all the way to fruition. And I mean, one of the things that to me, at least in Sun's history, Sun had this, I think, very revolutionary product in Sunray. And infamously, uh, the airlines were trying to figure out what their kiosk story was going to be. This is when they were, you know, they're, they're, they're first beginning to, to uh, computerize all the, the, these, these terminals for people to use. And Sunray was very, very tempting, but there was no USB printing support for, for Sunray. And uh, Sun just like wasn't interested in USB printing. It was just really gross not really sexy, not a fun problem, uh, really difficult to well, do. There, there, there's some known impossible problems, and among them are making printers work on you. <laughs> That's right. Exactly, right. And so they didn't and, – and I remember talking with the folks that – because this was all happening. American Airlines was doing this, and I remember talking to the folks in Itasca um, in, and just in general in Chicagoland – who were like, and Shaheen, I know you saw this too inside of Sun when you had these folks in the field that are like, you know, red alert. Like we need to get this, we are going to, if we lose this business in the next nine months, all the airlines are going to do whatever American does. And they're all going to, and we will lose this business completely. And there's this, and it, Sun just couldn't summon it until it was too late. And then when it was too late, they did try to summon it, but it was ultimately it was it was ultimately too late. And I, you know, I kind of feel like if you are going to be early, and Sunray was early, you know, Dan, all the things you're describing are obviously very early. You just have got to be willing to really grit and grind to get it all the way through and to make it real. You can't just be attracted to the shiny object. You, you you've got to be you've got to have I think culturally value getting those innovations all the way into customers' hands and at the coal face. And, you know, I thought, you know, Sun was kind of hit and miss on that. Like sometimes it was good and sometimes it wasn't good. That's why we did Fishworks, honestly, because we were kind of sick of this stuff, of some really interesting stuff not getting into customers' hands because it wasn't productized. Um, so we wanted to really go after a very focused market with a product that was pulling together all of this stuff. But it was the exception, not the rule at Sun. And I, I think probably, I dare say, at DEC as well. I think it's just really challenging to cross those chasms and go from something that five customers want to something that everybody wants and yeah. figure out which ones th those are. And Sun wasn't very good at it. And, you know, I'd like, I mean, my observation is that somebody like an IBM is good at it. I don't know how good they are now, but they traditionally have had a good strategy process and they fund things for success, whereas Sun specialized at funding things not for success. <laughs> It was, yes, especially it the house. Like, you know, it was like we fund you, and if you're a hero, you will be successful. And well, that, yeah, and that proves that you're awesome, and the product is awesome. Well, and I feel like Michelin. How many times did we see, and surely this happened to Danny as well, where you had things killed at the moment that they're beginning to get traction? It's like you, you find, you know, you've stood by this thing for two or three years. It's finally beginning to get some traction, and now you put the bullet in the brain. It's like, what are you doing? This yeah, is like exactly, exactly. Just when you're getting to the finish line, they would pull the plug. Now, you know, Scott himself used to say that you got to have the staying power. That like Java would never have happened if you didn't stay with it. But staying power is exactly what somebody like a Microsoft has. Well, simply because they had the margin dollars to do it. And some other companies have, but uh, but it's but it's hard to do. Is really, I, I agree that it's hard to do. It's whole kind of the innovators dilemma thing. 
Totally is. Tim, I saw you getting in here. Oh, no, just listening. Oh, there you go. Um, and Ben, I know you had your hand up a, a bit ago, and I know that I obviously is certainly a veteran of at least a couple of these companies. Yeah, well, the moment may have passed, but I was just one. We've talked before, like uh, Google, you know, they bring up uh, the shiny object, new product, and then it falls by the wayside. And some speculate that that's because the whole incentive structure for employees is to show impact. And uh, you don't have much impact for maintaining something like your established customer base. And I was just wondering, uh, do we know enough about the internal uh, culture of these companies to, to contrast those? What was it like being a DEC employee um, versus, uh, you know, what we think might be more supportive for uh, good product, good customer experience, longevity of products? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Certainly my read on it is that, and this is where I just, and maybe I'm reading too much into what feels like the familiarity from Sun, but the same kind of autonomy to a fault where you have different groups with different views on things. Good news is you can kind of do what you want to a degree. Bad news is that the company itself is not going to be coherent and you're going to have to fight other groups to actually get something all the way over the line or, or, I mean, just the, the witness the, the, this kind of the, the approach they, they took with the three PCs, but, um, you know, that, that, that's not necessarily always true because AWS is famously totally incoherent. Oh, um, you know, the, the try and spot a pattern, you know, at any given reinvent about what gets announced. And that's because they, they empower the teams and they all charge off in every direction. And, and somehow in that case, it seems to work fine. I'm not smart enough to figure out why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So, Tim, do they pit – are there rival efforts inside of one another? I mean, I think Adam had said this earlier. I mean, is that – like, how do they make that work? Because it is interesting and surprising. Yeah, there are, there are some rival efforts. Um, but here's the thing. In, in, in that space, there's so much territory to attack. I mean, you know, the cloud is huge, but it's still, you know, 8% of enterprise IT. So, yeah. you know, there, there's, there's empty ground in every direction to charge into. Um, but you know, the, the policy there is don't hold people back. You know, if they can make a case, there's people out there who need this thing, let them build it. Yeah. Well, the obvious example that comes to, to my mind on parallel efforts within AWS is how many different ways are there to run a container? You have Amazon ECS, which is their proprietary elastic container service versus EKS. Uh, the Elastic Kubernetes service, and more recently, Amazon App Runner, which I think is based on some of the same internal infrastructure as ECS, but is kind of different and a oh, more and, high and, level and, thing. And, and Fargate too, and lots more. And then on the messaging <laughs> side, there's SQS and SNS and MQ and uh, managed Kafka, and I'm, I'm forgetting a few in here, but uh, you know, it all seems to work. Yeah, right. Okay, I guess right. I, I and of course now I'm really regretting asking if there are rival efforts because I could answer that question myself with all those all the things you just rattled off, Tim. Um, well, I I think we want to uh, I, I wrap up here. I know we were trying to keep these to an hour, but of course this was a uh, a, a topic that I think is, is pretty mesmerizing. Uh, sorry, Jason, I know you've had your hand up. You want to get the, the kind of the last word in here? Oh well, it just I guess it's. Kind of, I mean, too late now. I just think when you're talking about the rival efforts within Sun, it just reminded me of an experience as the customer where we were asking for better patch management, and basically the answer was, well, there's two groups that wrote two different engines, and they're fighting each other, and they can't agree on which one will actually be the solution to ship to customers, so you just got to wait. Uh, well, that sounds and, right. Yeah, that, that, exactly, that's exactly right. That's a, the, the, no lies detected. Um, <laughs> I feel that, it, and you know, it, it's kind of this thing too about these three rival efforts, and they, that they kind of the three rival PC efforts, and and putting them all in the customer base. I think, you know, I, I used to joke that Sun's motto should be "We're confused, so you don't have to be." Um, <laughs> be but the reality is, a lot of that confusion is exported to to the customer, and you know, it's a challenge to uh, how do. You and I, I do think that you know Amazon has pulled this off to a better de degree, um, but yeah, there's there's a balance there between um, giving folks what they need and but not allowing rival efforts to stymie one another or compete with one another. I mean, it's it, it's it's 
I, it's challenging. I think, Shaheen, I go back to what, what you said about, about losing track of the customer. Um, and I, I, I do feel that is the thing that Amazon does exceedingly well, that Sun did well at its height, that I think Deck did well at its height, but I think it's easy to lose track of, which is always putting yourself in your customer's shoes. You know, yeah. Let me get in with, with one more war story that I think was uh, really the, the death signal for me around deck. And I'm, I'm see, you see it happen in technology companies systematically. So I already said the sales organization was obsessed with IBM and they just needed to be more businesslike. If they were more businesslike, then they'd be like IBM. And the story I'm going to tell is when they launched the VAC 750, which was, you know, uh, it sold a ton of, of computers and was, was a very successful product. And... Um, what happened was they had this this launch event and they had a room full of people and this is not a headquarters this is out in the field right to announce this new computer and they showed like 25 slides all about business now we understand your business model we're all about doing business and the crowd's getting madder and madder because they want to find out how much memory it has and, you know what this clock speed right. is and all this stuff and they just would not do that and what the price was and they got like 45 minutes of this businessy crap and then like in the last five minutes they said oh and it's going to cost you know whatever it cost and, and so on. And, you know, as I, one of the, as I was getting ready to leave Amazon, I was starting to see that actually come in a bit at AWS saying, you know, we, we shouldn't be so bits and bytes, bitesy. We should be more, uh, you know, businessy because, you know, there's the people who make the decisions. Although at both DEC and AWS, the way they got to where they are was by getting the technologists on board and routing around management. Um, yeah. So, so there's, there's a big danger there. That's all. That, uh, that is a, th that's, a great story, Tim, and uh, a, a great one to end on, I think. Uh, certainly, um, I, I, I know as we, I find it super interesting to go through these because there's a lot to learn. And I think that's something we can all learn is the, the technologists that make the decision and understand, put yourself constantly in their shoes. Don't lose their perspective and don't, please don't uh, bury them with bullshit. I would, I would add one more little thing here, which is we all kind of owe Digital Equipment Corporation a debt of gratitude. I mean, if it had not been for deck machines, most of the technology that we take for granted today would have evolved in a very different way. And, and I, you know, that's the internet, Unix, C, you name it. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, right, yeah, so I, there a, a lot to be said for deck and uh, Adam, I, to the degree that you end up getting um, th these books end up drawing you in. I apologize in advance for, for <laughs> flooding your queue. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Really interesting company in history. Yeah, awesome stuff. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great, great to hear from so many people but, and familiar voices and, and some new ones, too. So great to hear from everyone. Take care.